Welcome to another chapter of In The Keep Podcast. I'm your very own prophet of the drowned god, the mother load. This show is all about the world of first person shooters, their legacies, their lineage, and the people who keep that world turning. It is the will of the drowned god Cathala that our communities band together to frag and jib one another into oblivion for all eternity. At long last, the unholy trinity of retro FPS is complete. We had the father, we've had the scuba diver, and now I bring you the arbiter himself, Mr. Dave Oshry. If you're not familiar with him, which I pity you, but if you are, not familiar with Dave Oshry. He is the CEO of New Blood. He's senior director over at Rocketworks. He's responsible for producing some of the most amazing games that have come out in the last several years, starting with Rise of the Triad remake and then moving all the way up till now where we have Dusk, we have I mean, Evil, we've got Maximum Action, we've got Gloomwood, the whole deal. We're going to get into every bit of it. Faith, I mean, I could just go on forever, but the point is, Dave is an amazing guest. I was very uh, just kind of blown away by his energy that he brought to the interview. And this personally well, is one of those that just really meant a lot to me because he's someone that I've been trying to get on forever uh, since the incarnation of this podcast. So I hope you enjoy it. We're going to play Dave in with some awesome dark ambient music made by our friend Igrak Simon, someone who I know really, really loves what Dave does. Just a huge New Blood fan in general and an amazing musician who's always been a friend of the show. So let that play, and when it's over, we'll be in the heat with Mr. Dave Oshry. Let's get going. Dave Oshry, you are finally on the podcast. It has been a long time coming. Yeah, a little bit, long time. I mean, uh, I wasn't ducking you, I swear. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Yeah, it's become a meme that I was like, I think he's just trolling me, dude. dude this guy <laughs> I'm a hard guy. Just... To, I'm, a, I'm a hard guy to pin down. I, I've told that to people. Like, I don't think there's been an episode of the show where we haven't talked about fucking Dave Oshry, you know, like so hard to get a hold of. And, and that's cool, dude. I get it. You're a fucking busy man. We're going to talk a lot about that throughout this interview. Yeah, I'm here, though. I'm here. You've got me for now. Yeah. So the Arbiter is here, folks. And the first thing I want to do is kind of get into a little bit about how you interact with fans and patrons and everything. Because as hard as you are to get a hold of in a business sense, you are not hard to find. Uh, you do a this great job of interacting with the people who patronize the companies that you work with. So... What's kind of your philosophy on that stuff? Uh, I mean, I really, I don't care about anyone kind of as much as I do about our customers. Like if somebody's willing, I've got this thing where I always say, if someone's willing to pay money for something that you made, you owe those people everything, right? You're nothing without them. So I go, I will bend over backwards and go out of our way for our consumers as much as I can, right? And it's just like, that's that's why you exist. Um Plus, it's just a lot of fun. I love interacting like with people. That's what you know. That's what the point of social media is, right? To be social. Some people like just putting shit out there and not don't like talking to people. I like talking to people, so that's why I use Twitter a lot. Um, that's why we're super active on the forums. But it's just, I mean, in, in this day and age, you don't just get to you know put out a game and be like, oh, I hope you know, here it goes, fucking hope you like it or whatever. It's like you gotta if you want to build a community and build better games, you gotta do it with the people that play your games. Um, that might not be everybody's philosophy, but it's mine. So I'm I'm always I'm super consumer forward. That's why I take our games to shows. Why I'm uh, now I'm out there on social media. Why I encourage all our developers to be super social. You know they all they all shit post as much as I do on Twitter. Um, we love to do giveaways and events and have fun and grow the Discord and you know community game nights and stuff like that. I just feel like that's the only way to be, especially in the indie scene. Um, cause like I wouldn't, and we've got a great, and you know, and we're reaping the rewards, right? Um, our sales are good. Our reviews are super good. People like us. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. I would not trade the relationship we have with our players for, you know, for awards or more money or whatever. Like we're good. I mean, I, I like the way we're doing stuff. I mean, other people might not want to do it that way, but that's the way I want to do it. It's kind of the philosophy at new blood, you know, we love you and we hate money. Um, so, uh, I think we're going to keep doing it that way, at least until we sell out, we get like a big deal from Epic and we just sell out and say, fuck you and peace. I think you've 
you know, just done an excellent job of kind of making your customers feel like part of like the, the new blood family. Like you've made this brand that people really feel attached to in a lot of ways. Like I, I know plenty of people who are just new blood dorks and they just follow everything you do and play every game that you publish. And that's a point that I'll have to make at some point is that when you guys put out a game, when we see new blood on it, we go buy it. Like that's just it. Like we know it's good. We know it comes from people who care. Yeah, and that's been a thing. Like we've kind of gotten crazy with the quality of our games to the point where we set such really high expectations, you know, with our games all being like 85 plus, you know, critical rated, 95 plus, you know, user reviews. Um, it's gotten to the point where like shit, we won't put something out, uh, like even demos, even like free demos we won't put out until they're like so polished. Like the Gloomwood demo, like we could sell that thing for 20 bucks and nobody would probably care, but just we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to just polish the shit out of the demo and then you know, the thing that we learned with Dusk was just if you build a game, there's, and this thing I like to say to other indies and other developers is in, in the year 2020, there's no excuse to put out a game and be surprised by the reception, right? There are so many avenues for you to test your game, to get feedback on your game, whether it's early access or demos or, you know, community. Uh, by the time your game comes out, if you're surprised by anything, if you're all, all of a sudden finding performance issues and bugs or like features that people just fucking hate, then you didn't do enough testing. Like you didn't get your game out there enough. You developed it in a vacuum. Like you should not be surprised by the time your game comes out. Um, and so the way that since it worked so well with Dusk and then it worked really well for Medieval, it's been working really well for Maximum Action. Obviously there's faith in that whole fan base. Uh, it's going to be start working well for Ultra Kill. You know, I think it's, you know, it's uh, it's not a secret anymore that I've been working with Hockada on that. He's been, uh, he's been on the podcast before. I listened to that episode. He had a lot of nice things to say. Um, and now Gloomwood, obviously, which is, you know, it's not just fast, fast, shooty, shooty, boom, boom. You know, it's, it's very slow. It's very methodical. Um, there's a lot more to test because of the different avenues you can go about encounters in that game. You know, it's got that very thief, day, sex, system shock, resident evil vibe. Um, but yeah, we've really set up kind of this like new bot, this new blood, like seal of approval, you know, remember like the old Nintendo seal of approval. Yeah. And I love the fact that I've seen a lot of comments like that where it's like, especially with Maximum Action, you know, people were like, oh, this game's an early access. Should I get it? And then the comments are like, oh, it's New Blood's working on it now. I know it's going to be good. Uh, and that means more to me than anything. The fact that like our logo and our brand is associated with the fact that this game will be good is you can't that you can't buy that. You can't fake that. Uh, you know, the fact that people see an early access game, but they see our name attached to it. They're like, you know, I don't usually buy early access games, but because New Blood's working on it, I know it'll get finished and I know it'll be fucking great. And like, that's, you know, it set a really high bar for us. But I mean, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of brand you can't buy. That's the kind of shit you can't fake. It's just, it just comes from us testing and playing and testing and iterating with our community and with our players and just making games that, you know, we, to the best that we can be. I mean, I think sometimes we're a little, you know, we're a little crazy. We're a little hard on ourselves. We'll get like one negative review out of like 10,000 and we'll be like, Oh, what did we do wrong? Um, but, um, I like that and I, I want to keep doing that. I just can't believe like kind of the work ethic that I see come out of you, especially when it comes to building brands. And it seems like you've been doing this for years and not just in the gaming industry, but, to kick off kind of like your game industry career, it looks like Interceptor Entertainment and the like the Apogee throwback stuff and then Rise of the Triad. So the story I got from Fred was that you had some money and you're like, hey, I want to invest in this Rise of the Triad project. And how did that kind of come about for you? So I was, so before any of that, I was a writer, right? I used to, right. I was a video game writer. I used to write for Kotaku, PC Gamer, Joystick when they were still around, VG247, you name it. I was like a blogger and then I was like a pretty good video game writer. I never say journalist because I never went to fucking journalism school or anything. <laughs> I was selling, I was selling used cars and then blogging about games for fun while I was playing World of Warcraft. This was like 2007, 2008. Um, and one of the games that I had covered for, um, I forget what website was Fred's Duke 3D Reloaded, um, mm -hmm. you know, project that never got made. Basically, you know, Fred was trying to remake Duke 3D in Unreal Engine, UDK at the time, back when, back before Unreal Engine 4 was free and you had to, you know, use UDK and pay if you wanted to use Unreal 3, but that's a whole nother fucking thing. Um, and like I had covered it and I wrote, I had like blogged about it and I was like, Hey, this looks pretty cool. I got, it had gotten a lot of coverage. Um, and then I was one of the people who was like interested in it. I think he had like, a uh, like you could donate and stuff. And I donated like some money, like a couple hundred bucks or something. And I was like, dude, this looks awesome. Let me know. 
um, you know, sending me wallpapers and stuff. I just wanted to be involved, right? I was a Duke fan. I thought it looked really cool. Um, and then when I was getting out of um, looking to get, I was looking to get done writing about games because it was like, you know, whatever at that point, it was never going to get better than 2011 writing about games, right? I got to like, <laughs> I was one of the first people in the world to play Skyrim. Uh, you know, I got to try, you know, VR with fucking John Carmack and Palmer Lucky and shit back when it was like, you know, uh, goggles and duct tape. Um, you know, and I think just writing about games has become less and less fun since then. Um, but I was looking to get out and I had a marketing background and I was still like doing stuff, living in New York. Um, and Fred got in touch, um, because I don't even, I don't even remember why the fuck he got in touch. I had given him like, I don't know, like literally like a hundred bucks. I don't know where he got the idea that I could be like an investor and marketing guy for his, uh, for his upcoming project. But he got in touch with me, I guess, cause he knew I had like an audience from being a writer. Um, and he was like, Hey, uh, you know, would you, you know, would you like to talk to this legendary publisher? Uh, we've got a game that we're going to be working on. And I was like, sure. Who the hell is he talking about? It turns out to be Apogee, not, you know, old Apogee, new Apogee, Terry from Apogee, you know, the 2000, Terry broke off a branch of Apogee from Scott and George in like 2009. Cause he wanted to use like the old logo and the old name and some IPs. Right. Um, and they had the rights to some stuff. So 3d realms was still 3d realms. Then Terry branched it off into like Apogee software LLC or something. Um, and I got on the phone and they, they pitched me, uh, they wanted to do Duke Nukem, uh, right? They wanted to do Terry still had the rights to like a couple of spin off games. And, you know, that whole thing went, you know, ended up being a giant lawsuit with Randy and all that stuff. That's a whole nother story. But they were like, hey, you know, we, we want to do this. You know, we want to basically, I think they basically wanted to do Duke Reloaded, but they had to call it something else and do some stuff. And I was, and they wanted like a bunch of money and stuff like that. Would you be interested? And I was like, I don't got that kind of money. I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like, it sounds cool. And, but I was like, I really don't, this was like right after Duke forever had come out. And I was like, I really don't want anything to do with Duke Nukem. <laughs> um, but like, good luck to you guys. You know, that sounds cool. I hope you get that game made. Right. Cause I was, you know, I was a fan of the Duke reloaded project. And at, just as I was about to get off the phone, I go, I was, I was like, do you guys still have the rights to rise of the triad? And Terry was like, yeah. And I was like, can we fucking make that game? And Fred was like, yeah, I love Rise of the Triad. And I was like, let's, let's, like, let's do that. And he was like, yeah, we could probably do that like way cheaper. It turned out to not be cheap at all. Uh, but like, I was like, shit, fuck it. I'm, I'm in. Let's, let's, and that's how we got the ball rolling. Um, and next thing you know, Fred was building a team. I was trying to raise some money. Terry was like getting us in touch with Steam. And uh, I don't know, two or three years later, we put out our, you know, our lovable janky reboot of Rise of the Triad and also did re-releases of the old Duke games, uh, the Apogee throwback pack. And uh, we kickstarted this whole fucking boomer shooter uh, renaissance that has uh, now led us to where we are now. And Big John was born. That's Yeah, Big John was born. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on, kill me, I'm here. Uh, Big John is actually, speaking of Fred, so people think Big John is just me doing an Arnold and Predator impression, uh, which it mostly is, but it's actually me doing an impression of Fred doing an impression of Arnold in Predator. Because Fred, Frederick is a huge Arnold fan, and there was like a big meme during Rise of the Triad development, how much he loves Arnold and everything Arnold and all. He's like the biggest Terminator fucking fan in the world. So Big John is actually me doing my Fred impression which sounds a lot like Big John. He's like, yeah, come on, we're going to remake Duke Nukem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is basically the same as Big John. When, when you initially did your Fred voice, I was like, that that's what made me think of Big John. I was probably going to go right over that if you didn't. Yeah, it's not it's not that different. It is my, Big John is me doing Fred doing Arnold in well, Predator. Now we, know. now we know. Yes. Then you guys published that. It kicks off this revolution of retro shooter, boomer shooter, whatever the fuck we're going to call it. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Um, the funny thing is we only started, I think we started Rise of the Triad 2013, like two months before they started Shadow Warrior at Flying Wild Hog. And they ended up coming out within like a month of each other. It's a weird time because it, it's like a lot of people seem to have the same similar sort of idea. I mean, everything is cyclical, right? I tell, yeah. I talk about this a lot. Everything goes in cycles. Music, mu music, music, movies, fashion, games, everything goes in cycles. So we were really getting, I think people were just tired of, 
you know, especially back then, indie games weren't like huge like they are now. People were just tired of, you know, the Call of Duty style, carry two weapons, hide behind uh, boxes type of gameplay. And people were like really missing the like carry nine weapons and jump around like a crazy person, you know, games, you know, from the 90s, you know, the Doom and Quake style games. So when the opportunity came up to do like Rise of the Triad, uh, that's what we wanted to do, right? And it was, you know, we got huge publicity off of that because, you know, we were like, oh, carry all these weapons, no regenerating health, blah, blah, blah. People were like, grr. Um, and then Shadow Warrior was kind of the same thing. You know, they were like, we're making we're making it like the old Shadow Warrior. Um, so I think, yeah, it was cyclical. Now, obviously, we've seen with all the things that have happened since, Doom, Wolfenstein, everything, you know, shooter, you know shooters where you can carry lots of guns and run real fast are, are back in fashion. Uh, and the same thing where it was like pixel graphics, you know, for a while, everything was 8-bit, then 16-bit. Now we're getting into N64 and PS1 looking graphics uh, with indies. You know, everything goes in cycles. Like that's going to be like, I'm telling you, PSX is like the next wave of indie games. It's like texture warped PSX looking games. I mean, I'm working on one right now, Ultra Kill. That's a hockey day, um, yeah. Yeah, and like obviously that's big in the in the, um, in the the horror indie scene right guys like puppet combo and airdorf and all those guys making those real silent hill one and two looking games uh fixed camera angle horror games very psx looking um that's the way it goes everything goes in cycles and it was cool to kind of just be on the cusp of that um and to see where we are now it's fun i mean we're all you know just kind of looking for that feeling that we got as a kid growing up playing these kinds of games right like those games aren't going anywhere, right? You could always boot up Quake or Doom or Blood or fucking whatever else and play the shit out of them. But like new experiences that evoke those same feelings, that's you know that's what does it, right? That's like the dopamine release. You're like, yeah, this feels like this feels like the good old days, and it's so it's fun. It's fun to work on that. It's fun to bring that experience to like a whole new you know wave of people. Not only you know us boomers who um, you know who love that shit from when we were kids, but like new people. Like I've had people you know who. You know, we're born, you know, after 1990, which still seems like they're like must be kids to me. When someone tells me they were born in like 92, I was like, what are you, 12? Uh, you know, but there's people who were born like after the year 2000 who like never played, you know, the old retro shooters. And they're like and they're loving stuff like, you know, uh, Dusk and a Medieval and Ion Fury and all these games or they they never played Turok, you know, but now they get to play it because of the Night Dive re-releases and stuff like that. So there's also this whole new wave of kids and, you know, not just kids, but obviously adults. Uh, who are appreciating this style of shooter, whereas before it was just, you know, stuff like, you know, Call of Duty or super scripted stuff or super slow stuff. And there's room for all that shit, too. Like, I love me a good Metro uh, Exodus type of game. Um, but, like, uh, I think there's really been an appreciation for what made all these retro shooters great. And without that, we wouldn't have this podcast. Oh, it's what it really comes down to for me is that, yeah, I'm one of those. 24 year old kids who fucking loves this shit like just fell in completely in love with the genre and it's partially yeah it's like a gimmicky thing it's like you know it's the popular in vogue deal right now but for years and years it wasn't and people were still mm. doing you know people were still making amazing doom content still pl- oh talking yeah i about, mean that you know, never that never went yeah. away man the doom community has been oh man it's 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 never gone away and i'd say it's stronger than ever you know the wads and stuff that are coming out for for sure and the availability of technology the spread of skills and the ability to communicate between people that to really just take it to another level and that's what they've done. But anything, you know, the whole genre itself, it really fundamentally hits marks that I think people just gravitate towards on a an equality basis, not just on a whatever, you know, is in style basis. Because the reality is, is in style as this feels right now, and as profitable as it has been, you know, for you, it's still not the most famous thing in the world. So, oh, yeah. It's, and it's super niche, you know, it's like, you yeah. know, sure, profitable, but like profitable enough to work on the next game, right? We're not making like millions. We're not selling millions of copies. Like, we're doing good, and the games are like super well received, great communities and stuff. But like, we're not doing Stardew Valley numbers over here, you know? It's still, it's still pretty niche. You got games like Dusk and Ion Fury, which are pretty niche. And then like a Medieval, which is like a niche within a niche because it's, you know, it's fantasy with, you know, mm-hmm. axes and swords and instead of guns i'm like i always tell leon i'm like if you want to sell more copies of a medieval just put some fucking shotguns in it and it'll sell a lot more copies um 
but like, yeah, it's niche, but it, it's fun. Um, and the thing that I like about them is like, they're all good. There's so many. It's a, like, we, we live in an embarrassment of riches of fucking good games. There's so yeah. many good games. And especially within this scene that we're in, you know, with the retro shooters and stuff, there's like, there's the stuff for the purists. There's the stuff for the new school people. There's stuff now like ultra kill that's mixing, you know, style shooters like devil may cry, you know, with retro shooters, you know, there's stuff like Proteus, you know, which, you know, looks like fucking, you know, doom 2016, but has a built in level editor. Um, you know, there's stuff that's going to work on switch. There's stuff that's going to work on Xbox. Um, there's everything. People are remaking everything. We, you know, we got black Mesa now it's, we, 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 there is no shortage of awesome retro shooter stuff. And it's, it's all good. That's the best part about it. Like it, there's not a lot of garbage. Like, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's roguelike stuff. That's fun too. I love shit like nightmare reaper. Um, there's just, there's so many, like, I can't even like, I'm trying to wrap my head around all the ones. Cause you know, I talk about them all the time. It's my wheelhouse. And it's just like, man, there's a lot of good fucking games out there. That's what I'm doing all the time, man. Just constantly monitoring, but what's new, what's cool. You know, what's, what's happening and what can I, you know, help to tell people about, because it's, my main gig here is like bringing people together to talk about this stuff. And that's yeah. been a really rewarding experience, even at like a fairly small level. But just to constantly yeah. be like, hey, have you heard about Dusk? Have you heard about the new New Blood game? Are you aware? You know, that they there's also other companies that do the same thing. Did you know about these indie titles on, you know, IO itch.io or whatever that are talking about, mm. you know, similar sort of things? And that's great fun. But then you uh kind of moved on from that project in 2014 and you started new blood and yeah so what was kind of your initial idea like you, you got a taste for the the industry there like i, li- I kind of yeah, like this so turning like, them over well, and after, tri- them out. after triad we all like fucking hated each other that, that game was a, <laughs> that game was a mess man like god i can't believe we even shipped the thing it was such a mess after that like me and fred and terry and any of those guys like barely wanted to talk to each other like we're friends now and stuff but after that we were like, it was just like fuck you fuck you fuck you you know we'd fight about money and shit all the time so whatever um but like i was like i was like i don't i don't, I don't know what i want to do they were going to go off to work on um fred wanted me because they were doing the duke thing right which ended up being bombshell because the lawsuit and fred wanted me to be the marketing guy on that and i was like nah i'm gonna go do something else um and um i me and my buddy aaron and craig who you might know as the craigasm guy face you know the uh, the face uh we started because we had a community called hbg back in the day hot-blooded gaming with our buddy Christian, who's still at New Blood, and we're like, let's just start our own fucking game company. Um, and we were like, sure, what do we want to do? I was like, I want to, VR was hot at the time, and I had access to that stuff. I was like, let's make a VR game. I was like, cool. <laughs> so we got a bunch of VR shit. Um, and I was like, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to punch people in the face. I want to punch the shit out of people. So we started working on a boxing game, um, which we never released. It was called Haymaker. Um, it was basically punch out in VR, like super cartoony, um like punch out like you know super punch out looking uh vr game um, and it was going places uh we had met with um oculus and valve in like 2014 at steam dev days and palmer lucky played it and nate played it and a bunch of guys from valve played it and they were super into it they're like if you can get this to a demo stage we could probably have this at gdc this was gdc 2014 where the only other thing they had back then was eve valkyrie that's mm-hmm. how like early to the vr game we almost were right we were like almost like a v like we were there like we were on the cusp we were on like the cutting edge we like we almost had a fucking game at the oculus booth at gdc 2014 that's how early to vr we were um and then it just kind of felt to shit craig quit um <laughs> and so they went our programmer uh and then we were just like well fuck now what do we do we tried to get a bunch of other small projects started um, but out, but without like a core programmer, like nothing really happened. And I was working at Gunner at the time, the glasses company. So New Blood mm-hmm. was kind of like a side hustle. Um, Aaron was trying to do shit, you know, while I was like working on it on the side. We had some, you know, people come and go, um, you know, 3D artists and stuff. We tried to keep Haymaker going, but we just, without the pro, the guy who was programming it, it just it was never going to happen. The demo is still around somewhere on a hard drive. Um, but so that whole VR thing just kind of went away. And then this is like, what, like 2015, 2016. Yeah, it's like 2015. Um, and we were trying to make like a top-down shmup shooter based on my friend's book, uh, Air Force Gator. 
uh, Dan Reichert, who used to be a giant bomb, uh, you, you know, everybody knows Dan, wrote a really stupid book in a sequel called Air Force Gator. And he's like, dude, you should make a game based on this. And I was like, that sounds amazing. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I would love to make a game called. If you've never read Air Force Gator, it's really stupid. It's about an alligator who's in the Air Force. And his like, dad fought in World War II and he saves the world in the Gator plane. It's fucking so dumb. Um, so we were trying to prototype it, trying to prototype it. And like, we couldn't get it. We were trying different art styles like tilt shift and shit. We, this was so early days. We were trying in UDK. Like none of us knew what we were doing back then, but we were, we were learning, right? We were prototyping, you know, we were, you know, we we're just trying to start, you know, start our own games up. Um, and I ended up finding on Reddit of all places like pixel art, uh, this dude who had a Kickstarter, this awesome, he had a really awesome style and he had a Kickstarter going for a game called super galaxy squadron. And I was like, dude, if we like, if I help your game, like get published and stuff, would you come like be the artist for air force Gator? And he was like, yeah, sure. So, and that's how new blood picked up super galaxy squadron. We ended up getting, you know, it got funded on Kickstarter. He wanted like 200 bucks on Kickstarter. Got It got like 10, 5,000 or whatever. Um, all the pro we ended up we polished it up we put it out on steam it did fine all the proceeds went to charity it was for child's play so like we had donated like ten thousand dollars to child's play and it was like a thing people were like hey new blood's got a game i was like yeah shit we got a game we had like a booth at pax we had super galaxy high score competitions we made art the soundtrack was on sale it was like a thing you know it was like a shit with i was like are we a publisher now Ooh. um so we started like doing kind of doing that. We helped out on some other games, a game called the red solstice helped that get that in early access. Um, and then, you know, we were just kind of trying to figure out what the fuck to do. We were like, I guess we're a publisher now. Do you want to start looking for games to publish? And then within like the span of like a few months, we got approached by some friends from the VR space who were working on a laser typing game, like a VR typing game. And I was like, dude, I would love to publish that. And then these other dudes came along and they're like, hey, we're working on this crazy, you know, fucking riot side scrolling beat 'em up game. You want to like publish our game? And then there was this dude on Twitter, this dude who had like three followers and he only followed like three people on Twitter. And it was me, John Romero and Tom Hall. Uh, and it was David. And at the time, I had been like kind of involved with Strafe. I helped them get like the deal with Devolver, and I gave them some money to get it funded. Um, and David tweeted at me, and he was like, "Hey, you should check out this game I'm working on." And I was like, "The fuck is this?" Uh, and it was Dusk, and it was yeah. I was like, "Do you have a build of this? The screenshots look cool." And it was a one room demo. And I think I've since uploaded that one room demo. I was like, you could just, you could jump around and shoot some stuff and like turn on the faucets and open the garbage can. And I was like, this is amazing. All the, all the movement was there. The feeling was there. The atmosphere was there. And this was just like a demo with like two rooms you could jump around in. But it was basically still the way Dusk feels now. Um, and I was like, I need to work with this guy. Um, and I, Aaron, my buddy who I started new blood with, who works down here in New Zealand with me now, he's from here. He was like, back then, you know, before I was the arbiter of taste for all these games, I was like, dude, I think I, before I knew what I knew, I was like, I had to ask, you know, I was like, dude, I think this is really good. Is this, is this as good as I think it is? And Aaron's like, you need to get this boy a contract. So I talked to David and I was like, dude, I would love to work with you on this. And David did not believe me. He was like, I don't know. My brother got involved with some like weird Russian publishers and they screwed him out of stuff. They said they were going to put his game on Steam and took all the money. I was like, OK, that's not me. <laughs> uh, but like, what do I need to do? And he made me write him like this whole fucking letter to prove that like I wasn't going to screw him and I really wanted to work with him on his game. And he was like, OK. Uh, and next thing you know, we had a contract in place to publish Dusk. And tonight we riot and laser type, and we came out with a trailer for all three of those games at PAX West 2016. And we're like, yo, we're New Blood. We're an indie publisher now, right? We were up there next to fucking, you know, had a booth next to like, you know, uh, Devolver and Raw Fury and shit like that. We're like, we're one of these guys. Um, fast forward a few years, Dusk is the only one of those three games that exists. Um, and it came out and we're no really longer a publisher, you know, we kind of do our own stuff. But at the time, that's kind of how we were figuring our shit out. Um, and after Dusk, uh, you know, we were in Dusk development and two of the dudes I had worked on Rise of the Triad with, Leon and Simon, came to me and they're like, hey, 
we're working on a retro shooter thing too. Do you want to check it out? And I was like, sure. And I booted it up, and the first fucking thing I was in, I was in the gateway of a medieval with the axe standing there. And I just looked around, and I was like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever fucking seen in my life. I was like, what is this art style? This is ridic- This is awesome. What is this axe? This is the coolest fucking shit I've ever seen. The gameplay was ass at the time. Like, the movement and the, yeah. like, and the shooting felt like shit. But, like, visually, it was, like, awesome. It was super early days. And as Leon said, I was like, listen, I'm interested, but, like, you've got to really tighten it up and prove to me that you can make it feel as good as it looks and then i'll totally be in on publishing this and working with you on it and they did and we signed up with a medieval next thing you know we had dusk and a medieval going we had super galaxy squadron going we're like a little indie publisher developer thing come 2016 2017 uh we're growing a community we started the new blood discord we start growing a community based around dusk um, and the, the reveal of Dusk blew the fuck up. It was on everything. It was on like CNET uh, and stuff. Like It was on like websites that like you wouldn't normally see this kind of stuff on, right? Um, which was wild. And I was like, oh shit, like we've got a thing. This could be a hit. And next thing you know, we've got a medieval going on. We've got Dusk going on. And it just, and, but I was like, how do we handle these games? Like, how do we QA these games? And these guys, like once again, guys, I had forum mods that I had worked with on Rise of the Triad. This kid, Cam, uh, who you might know as Unmutual, um, he's like, hey, man, like we could, me and my buddy Scott and some of these other, we could be like your QA team and help you with these games if you like bring us into the company and turn it into a real company and, you know, pay us and shit. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, sure. I, that, that sounds, that could, that could work. Uh, so next thing you know, we've got our own QA team and dev support you know scott you know 500 points turns out like he's you know he's a good programmer and he ended up being the guy who made dusk world as well as the lead dev support for dusk it was like you know if david had a problem with stuff scott would work on it with him next thing you know it wasn't just david making the game anymore it was david with dev support and a qa team and me as a producer and andrew doing the music obviously andrew who worked on rise of the triad with us as well um you know like me and fred always say if it wasn't for rise of the triad none of these games would fucking exist like, you know, Ion Fury, A Medieval, Dusk, Wrath, uh, you know, pr- none of these games would fucking exist if we didn't do our janky, lovable Rise of the Triad reboot in 2013, which is pretty wild. And the next thing you know, New Blood's like a company with like employees and a QA team and dev support and like three games coming out. Um, and then they did. And Dusk comes out and it's a huge fucking hit, followed by A Medieval six months later, you know, back to back in six months. Um, and next thing you know, we're like we're chilling right it was like shit we're a company we're known for these type of games uh cool we've got a little community we're like we're popular on social media people like our shit they like our shit posting they like me they like david uh you know leon and simon are doing well um and then you know you know we we got guys like civi and g-man making videos and being all up our ass for like what's the next thing that they want to cover um and and that those that community was growing too. Like it was funny. Like back in the day, the only guy that covered these games, rest in peace, was Total Biscuit. You know, John used to be the fucking. You know, he would make he could make or break your game. You know, if John covered your game and he liked it, you were set. And that was a big part of Rise of the Triad, the fact that TB liked it. And if he didn't like your game, you were trash, right? And then John died. Uh, you know, he got cancer and he died. And then guys like. You know, Civi and G-Man and Icarus kind of picked up the torch for people on YouTube who cover these kinds of games because they're not mainstream, right? You know, you know, PewDiePie and fucking, you know, John uh, fucking, uh, you know, Markiplier uh, and Jacksepticeye are not playing boomer shooters, right? Uh, they're playing Faith, though, which is cool. Um, you know, so it's niche. And so, like, as we were growing and, you know, stuff like, you know, um, Night Dive and 3D Realms and us, like, bringing these retro shooters back, YouTubers that cover them were also having a resurgence. You know, guys like Civi and G-Man and Icarus and, you know, Psychedelic, Psychedelic Eyeball. And there's, you know, there's tons, right? But, like, you know, their channels were growing. Our games were growing. Our communities were growing. This podcast was happening. So this was all kind of happening at the same time. And then on the AAA side, you had shit like Shadow Warrior, Wolf, you know, the new Wolfenstein games, Doom 2016. Like, this whole retro shooter thing was growing all at once from all sides. Um, and we were, like, right in the middle of it, which was pretty cool. Um, and then, so we're just like, we're, we're just looking for more fun shit to play. And this game pops up on steam and I, we hear about it thanks to G man. Um, and it was this janky ass John Woo, Max Payne looking thing called maximum action. 
Mm-hmm. And we're like, we all start, we pass out, we pass around the build in our internal Discord. Um, and we're all like, yo, this game fucking broken as shit, but it rules. Uh, and we're like, who makes this? It's got to be like some slobs somewhere in a basement uh, in the middle of nowhere. It turns out to be this 18 year old Chad from University of San Diego named George who yeah. put the game yeah. out, who made the game by himself and put it out the day before he left for college, not thinking anything of it. He's like, he just threw it up on Steam, like, hey, if, you know, it's my game. Um, but because of guys like G-Man, next thing you know, it blows up. People are like playing it. It's selling copies. Um, and we get in touch. We're like, yo, we would, you know, and at the time we're still like, you know, we can bring in games nowadays. Like we're swatting games away. Like we only develop shit internally. We're like, we're not a publisher anymore. Fuck off. Um, but back like, you know, 2017, 2018, we were still like, yo, this could really be a nice fit for us. If the dude's cool. Right. That's still the biggest thing. Like if you have to be a good fit. Right. For we don't just like we're not like a publisher where we go see a cool game and we're like, cool, let us know when it's 90 percent done and we'll yeet it out with some fire tweets and hope it makes you some money. Like if you work at New Blood, like you work at New Blood, you work on all the games. Everybody's, you know, we're in this together. But so we get in touch with George. and He's like, yeah, that might be cool. And it, he's young. So we had to go back and forth with him and his lawyers and his parents. And we're like, yo, listen, I really like you. I like your game. I'm going to make you a shit ton of fucking money. Tell your parents to just sign the fucking contracts or whatever the hell you need to do because I want to get working on this game. And at the time, Maxim actually was still super broken. Uh, and it allowed me to, and I was like, listen, this game needs some sizz magic, which is what we like to call what David, uh, you know, David can do, right? We're like, we'll get some sizz magic. And it turns out there was another Szymanski brother, John oh, yeah. Szymanski. And John, you know, David's like, hey, I've got a brother who's a programmer and he's pretty good and he would like to work with us too. And he's working two shitty jobs like a janitor and a barista and he would much rather be working games. And I was like, well, shit, we need someone else to work on Maximum Action. So we get John in there and we're like, hey, you know, we you can he can be the second Maximum Action developer. We need to get this, this game super broken, but it's got a lot of potential. The reviews are tanking. We got to get in there. We got to put the new blood stamp on it and we got to get we got to get rocking and rolling. So we combine the talents of George, who's awesome. You know, like just all maximum action at its core is George, right? The kid has a fucking gift for making guns and making them shoot. And he loves the, also George is 18, right? So you'd think he'd be inspired by like, you know, shit like Max Payne one and two and the specialists and shit like that. The game that inspired him the most was Max Payne three. Cause it came out when he was 12. That's how young he is. <laughs> you know so it's wild and like hong kong action movies but then we get johnny in there and david in there we clean it up we clean up the code base we add some new shit fast forward to now you know maximum action is one of our top sellers reviews are at 90 percent um it's on track to you know come out of early access it's got steam workshop support and it's just been another banger for us um and that's like where am i up to 2018 and i'm like listen i am and at this point we had shipped you know, Dusk, a medieval, Maximum Action's doing well in early access. We're rolling into 2019, summer 2019, feeling really good about everything. And we are burned the fuck out on boomy shooties, right? Ultra Kill's another story, but we'll get to that. But we're like, listen, we don't want to be, we just don't, there's like, there's so many of them now. Like, we don't need any more. Um, we want, I want to start, I want to start expanding what we're doing. Um, and David's really big in the horror scene, right? The indie horror scene is so cool. There's so much cool shit there. I love the indie, the indie horror scene, you know, with guys like Airdorf and Puppet Combo, and you know, so we're gonna have plays. him back and do the Finger Bones podcast. Now that I think yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was like, listen, man, like we should do some more horror stuff. Um, I would love to get into that. David loves that stuff. So does you know all the other guys at New Blood. Yeah. And David's been buddies with Airdorf for a while. Um, and obviously I had known about faith. I known faith was a thing, right? It's got, you know, the biggest YouTubers in the world have played it. I've known, you know, Mortis is a fucking meme. Um, and I was like, this, like, what's he trying to do with the game? Right? Like, should we talk to him about that? Um, it turns out, you know, Mason, is a super cool dude. Uh, he fit in perfectly with the new blood shit posting family. Um, and that's how we were like, we're working on faith now too. I'm like, dude, I want to fit. I, I, I played faith. The thing about all these games that we work on is the developers are just special in their own way with the kind of shit that they do. Like, like when I first played Dusk, I was like, oh, this dude is on some shit. When I first played Faith, I was like, this guy is fucking holy shit. This is like, it's all Kino, right? It's like fucking woof. It's like, it's insane how good they are at these specific styles. 
Uh, I was like, wow, I, this is, you know, I played Faith. When I first played Gloomwood and I touched the first doorknob, I was like, that's a thief doorknob. That's a motherfucking thief doorknob. That's a, this, this guy knows his shit. Uh, when I played Ultra Kill, I was like, there's something here. Like it, it, the developers all, you know, just they're, uh, they're not faking it. They're so good at that style that they're into. And I just want to help them, you know, build that out into a better experience, a more accessible experience, one that can sell, one that we can put a brand behind. So they just have to focus on making the games. Um, so I was like, dude, I would love to work on Faith. I would love to like have you finish chapter three and us to bundle it all up and put it out on, you know, Switch and Xbox and PS4 and, you know, you know, have it blow up. And he was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So that's what we're doing with him now. Plus he's a professional animator, so he can help us out on that side. Now we're making a fucking Faith visual novel. That's a thing that we put out as an April Fool's joke that we're actually going to do because why not those sell? And then uh, with Gloomwood, we're dipping our toes into the thief spiritual successor. I mean, we've done Heretic, we've done Quake Blood. Uh, you know, why not Thief and System Shock and Deus Ex? So what we're trying to do now with New Blood, now that I've caught you up from 2013 to 2020, is kind of expand our horizons into other games. Because if we were just going to do boomer shooters, not there's anything wrong with them, but there's so many, we would have to. It, it's got to be either different. Like, uh, like we're not going to make a, a Dusk that's going to top Dusk. We're not going to make it a Medieval that's going to top a Medieval. We're not going to make a Maximum Action that's going to be sillier than Maximum Action. Uh, so we've, we're trying to branch out, right? So more horror stuff, uh, doing the immersive sim stuff. And with Ultra Kill, it was interesting because it's like, is there room? Because I've been talking to Hakata for a while, and I think the big reason I want to work on it is because of him and how fast he works and the pace he works and the reverence he has for us and the way I think he's going to fit in with the team. And I was like, is there room in our portfolio for a retro shooter that's also a style shooter? Is that something that is different enough um, from the rest of our games that, it's, that it can still fit in? And I was like, you know what? I think so. Plus, there's a lot going on there that people don't recognize. When I started to learn, and I got a lot of this from your podcast, listening to him talk about the different layers, you know, different circles of hell and how it's based on Dante's Inferno and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And I started playing the demo more and I got to, you know, I got out of the prelude, which we're working on because prelude needs work. Um, and I got into Limbo where it's all bright and sunny and there's like, I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And I got to the first slow segment where I'm like reading shit and I'm like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? And then, you know, and I got to the boss fights and I'm like, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. This There's some real subversive dusk type shit going on. Um, I was like, and, and the gameplay was really starting to click. G-Man was up my ass and he was like, this game feels like fucking indie doom eternal. You got to work on this game. And the more I heard that from people and the more I started playing it the intended way, which was like dash, dash, weapon, switch, weapon, switch, weapon, switch, dash, dash, mod, mod. And after do I played doom eternal, I was like, holy shit, they're right. This is indie doom eternal. So that combined with the Hockett is worth ethic. And the, you know, as much as I like the dude. And the fact that I think there's a lot more going on there than people realize, plus just going through my brain thinking how fun it's going to be to market a fucking robot Dante's Inferno shooter uh, that's also a style shooter. Um, I was like, you know what? We got to We got to do it. We got to work on this game. So I think, you know, if there was any wiggle room in the in the portfolio for another boomer shooter, Ultra Kill's the one. It's kind of the first thing I brought up to him was like that. Yeah, it looks like a boomer shooter, and it is a shooter, and it does look old, but that's about all it has in common with it. The way that game functions is totally, completely unique and on its own. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's... There's nothing really to compare it to, except now Doom Eternal, but exactly. he didn't that, you know? Yeah, at the time, he didn't, and now I think we gotta strike while the iron's hot, especially because yeah. there's, there's a lot of content in the game ready, the gameplay is really good already, I'm... I think we're definitely going to be able to get it to a state where early access this summer is it's going to be a thing. I think it's going to do really well. I think it's going to. Uh, I'm I'm excited to get Hockey to that place where I got David and Leon and Simon and Andrew just like and George and uh, you know be like congrats you've got a hit game now. <laughs> you know it's cool. That's that's my favorite thing I think about what I do is being able to you know, take these talented people. Cause like, I can't fucking develop games, right? I'm a producer. I, I yell at people. I may, I get games made, but I can't, you know, I don't, I can't make the sauce. I can only, you know, I can only put the sauce in the window of the restaurant and be like, you like it. The sauce is good sauce. Trust me. It's a good sauce. You want this sauce. Um, 
uh you know so just being able to do that you know what i've been able to you know do for david or leon and simon or you know even andrew you know, and george like i don't i don't like to talk about how much money like i've helped george make with maximum action because his parents might be like you made how much <laughs> you know because he's still he's like 19 um but like it's really cool to be able to do that for people and to be able to keep doing that for people and i think the fact that people like hockett are recognized you know, the strength of the New Blood brand or me as a producer, director, or David as a creative director or the QA team to be able to you know, make sure these games come out with essentially no bugs or issues, you know, you know, maximum action aside, uh, even though the bugs there are like there's no more like breaky, breaky bugs. They're all silly bugs. But that's just the strength of New Blood and our QA team and our dev support and, you know, our brand. Um, you know, same thing with Gloomwood. I think it's we've gotten to a point, like you said, where we we're crazy about quality like we take our sweet ass time like if we were about money man we would have got dusk out on switch like two years ago you know we would have put out expansions we would have just worked on dusk but i like the way we're doing things i like the portfolio we're building i like the developers that we've got in the family um it feels really good and it's fun we're going to be opening an office well we were going to open an office i was going to sign the lease but then the world went to shit um up in erie by david um, you know, we've been able to, I've heard there's a mythical third Samansky brother that I might be able to hire. Um, he did mention but, that. Yeah. So yeah. that's where we're at now. That's where new blood's at. So I've, I've caught you up from rise of the triad up until now. And it's, and it's all good. You know, like I say, we love you and we hate money. So if anybody wants to know the history, they can just go listen to this podcast. I hope I didn't leave anything out or anyone out. I don't think so. Probably Steve, but everybody always forgets about Steve. I didn't forget about Steve. He was like the first person that actually you know, sat down and we got shit faced at QuakeCon and just talked about all this stuff. You know, that's, I was going to have Steve like on. Steve. I was like, let's you fucking have, have you on. You sound great. I, I still want to. He's just, he's like, no, you should talk to Dave and you should talk to David. <laughs> I'm like, no, Steve, we want you on the show. Like, we like, want Steve. We want Steve. Steve's the maybe best. Maybe we can make it happen. Just having Steve around makes everybody's day better. It's like having our own Chris Farley. You never yeah. know when he's going to, you never know when he's going to fall through a table. <laughs> so then we got to bring up the new blood podcast which yeah we kinda, did one yeah i like it i really do like as a podcaster just as someone who likes that kind of shit in general i thought it was far better than i actually expected it to be no thanks First of, and second of all like that particular episode was really cool kind of like the post-mortem on the release of doom eternal and you had an amazing panel of guests you got some pull i mean obviously the people are just going to run straight to everything that you do for uh, to a certain extent which is great like I, I love that about what you guys are doing and that you've kind of built this cult of personality around what you do and so i checked out the show and then you guys said one thing in particular that really appealed to me was the dusk or uh, world 2.0 and potentially like a free-to-play new version of dusk world and yeah i think so that will bring us full circle to like what got us interested in you guys in the first place was that Dusk World? The yeah, that's crazy, right? The huh. Dusk World group was within the keep. Like that was we did a tournament for it. We had Brand Flakes and we had Cease Pool was like third hey. person on the show. We yeah, had Cease is, Cease is too good, man. That's the problem with Dusk World. You got like three people who are better than the other five thousand yeah. people. And well, Brondo is like He's yeah. amazing at Unreal Tournament. Like that's where he really comes from, and he's just—I don't know why he's not making money as a pro gamer. But well, I'll let him answer that question some other time. But <laughs> yeah, that that brought a lot of attention to because we were you know playing Quake and shit like that over here, and and then I was like, oh, there's a, D Dusk looked cool anyway. But then we saw there's this cool like arena multiplayer, and yeah, it's totally janky and fucked up. But we had a lot of faith that hey, this could be really good. Like this movement style, and like if they actually take this on and tackle it and or even, you know, do an SDK and turn it over to the public like Doom happened, then yeah. it'd be an amazing arena shooter. It would be lots of fun. Yeah, I mean, we we made it so, I mean, listen, if it wasn't for Dusk World, we would have had Dusk out a lot sooner. We would have had Dusk on <laughs> GOG and Switch a lot. Making a multiplayer indie PvP game is a terrible idea, but we promised it, and I think it adds value, and listen, it's fun. Um, but I think at some point it would be cool to kind of just break it off as a free as a free game and just you know with some you know who knows if there'd be any paid shit maybe you could pay to get like a gold skin or some bullshit for a dollar you know i'm not we're not gonna put like microtransactions and leveling up and stuff i don't know maybe um but like just kind of as a you know just a free thing that's out there is kind of just serves as an advertisement for dusk right right um 
you know, we want to make Unfortunate Spacemen free to play. Ah, that's what I forgot about, Unfortunate Spacemen. Uh, the game that we took on because I wanted Zag to help me make VR games. And he's like, sure, just help me finish the, my my multiplayer, you know, space shooter thing. And I was like, okay, three years later, <laughs> we're still working. <laughs> but also Zag now works with me down here at Rocketworks in New Zealand. So everything kind of worked out. Um, but yeah, we're working on making that free to play. I mean, listen, multiplayer and there's not there's the players don't exist, right? Arena shooters right. are fucking dead. People are like, are they dead? I'm like, yes, they're dead. They're all dead. Like, is is diabolical dead already? Probably. No, I don't think so, man. I, dead, I dead is one way. Like, de- is it a profitable thing for you to venture in as a game developer? Probably not. No. Is there a real serious seam of people like that actually? love it and play it for the sake of playing it like war fork or you know quake champions even though quake champions by bethesda numbers is dog shit it's yeah. i got a community of people who really care about it yeah it's good i wish more people played them i think the issue is there's just so many games out there i don't think it's a pr- mm-hmm. it's definitely not a profitable venture for indies if indies that tell me they're working on a pvp game at all i'm like don't do it there's no yeah, players yeah. you won't get players but everybody says they want arena shooters back but they don't put their money where their mouth is uh you know hopefully diabolical does okay but there have been so many over the years that have tried and even the mighty quake champions i mean it's doing okay but like as far as they're they're basically probably going to sunset it eventually Mm -hmm. um you know because it just it never took off because there's just the 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 players aren't there for them everybody's playing overwatch and valorant and you know csgo still you know a thing everybody's playing you know mobas you know league is still taking it just the players aren't there for pvp shooters especially old school pvp shooters am i glad they're there I, the, the thing i always say is because people say oh they're dead there's no arena shooters there's tons i could name you fucking half a dozen right now that have no players just because people act like they want them but then they don't actually go and look for them right uh like remember reflex that was cool for like five minutes <laughs> uh there, there's like there have been there's so many people have tried um you know uh but i think i'm glad dusk world exists uh, you know, we're going to eventually support it with more stuff when we can, you know, like the SDK and stuff and let people just go crazy. Uh, hopefully we make it free and then more people will play it besides playing it on the weekends, but it's tough, man. Arena shooters. Like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't recommend working on one. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. Uh, just especially like, it's so hard to make fast paced stuff work well <laughs> because it's so goddamn fast. Uh, you know, and working with, you know, with the net code and everything like that and, you know, latency, it's just like, oof. I've talked to several people who, you know, if yeah, you know, they're trying to develop an arena shooter. And my first question is always like, why the fuck would you do that? Like, yeah. what's what's wrong with you? But, you You're know, not gonna like, make I, any money. well, it's a passion project for a lot of people or like, for you sure. know, Doombringer is a single player game first and foremost. And then he's got this amazing kind of like dark places thing going on with it. That is a PVP quake three style game which is really cool and i love that yeah it's i mean listen that's that's the only kind of you know i don't i'm not a multiplayer guy david's not a multiplayer guy people often Mm -hmm. think we are because we work on these retro games like no we like the single player part (laughs) um i'm glad that you know they keep people keep trying you know i I'll, i'll check out diabolical eventually hopefully it's good um you know i liked quake champs uh i thought it needed some help with onboarding and stuff i think you know but just I wish more people played them. I wish there was more of a scene around them. It's more of like a zeitgeist. You know, that's what you need. You need people talking about it. You know, like the way they're talking about Valorant and shit mm-hmm. like that. You know, you need just you need that you need that conversation to be going. So people go, yeah, maybe I should play. Because I was into Quake Champs for like a couple of months. I was getting my drops every day. Like it did a lot of things right, but it just at the end of the day, it just wasn't there. And now you see with you know um, Doom Eternal. Obviously, they're you know they're they're like we couldn't just do because Doom 2016 multiplayer was a big flopola. Even though I liked it a lot, I like Doom 2016 multiplayer a lot, and I tell people that all the time. Um, but they wanted to change it up, so now they've got battle mode. Um, right. And I've heard mixed thing. I've heard mixed things on that. I haven't been able to connect because I live in New Zealand, and I don't think the Bethesda servers like me very much. You're not the only uh, one. Man. It's not. Yeah. It's not a New Zealand thing, but yeah um but like i think changing it up is a good idea i think just the classic just free-for-all formula is not going to hook people like it used to because these games now are built to to hook you in and keep you stuck there you know um it's always about drops and crates and all this Mm -hmm. shit you know it's not just about jumping around and shooting people anymore because people will do that for a little while you know, and we see it with Dusk World. They're like, cool. You know, I like that it's a fun multiplayer add-on for Dusk. Like, if you do you like Dusk and the movement of Dusk, go try that out against the person. 
I like that it's there, but I would never put my eggs in that basket, man. It's just, right. I think the world has kind of moved on. Um, and, you know, while I think a lot of us look back fondly on that kind of multiplayer gameplay, I don't think it's ever going to reach the heights that it originally did. We're not going to be filling League of Legends style stadiums with Quake players, unfortunately. But like, man, I'll, I'll watch fucking Rafa and Evil go at it forever till the end of time playing quake man those are still man quakecon i miss like when they would do the finals parties back when they did it back when they still did you know um quake live instead of champions like three four years ago and it was just every year was rafa and evil or rafa and somebody else it's always rafa versus somebody rafa should just clone himself and i would watch rafa play rafa that'd be good yeah, um, left hand versus right hand Let's yeah but those um those were my favorite matches to watch. Quake is still my favorite thing to watch. Like I don't watch esports. I'm not into esports. Go figure. Big surprise. Um, but like I'll, you know, man, I'll still always watch those Quake finals. Those were the, those were some of the funnest moments of QuakeCon for me, man. That's because that's high skill level FPS gameplay, right? Like I went to the COD champs one year, and like, there's so much fucking aim assist. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, they did a slow mo replay of like the the kill cam. And the crosshair is like a foot to the left of the guy. And it's like, bump, 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 bump. And the crowd's like, yeah. And I'm like, he didn't even hit him. What the fuck? Um, and I was like, cool. I guess that's where we're at with FPS gameplay these days. <laughs> um, so I miss the skill-based stuff, man. That's why I like watching. Like, if I'm going to watch esports, it's going to be fighting games. Because, like, man, you some some DBZ fighters and fucking Street Fighter, like, that's that's high skill level stuff. And then Quake and shit and Unreal Tournament, that's high skill level stuff. That's if I'm going to watch esports, which I don't really, that's what I like watching. Anyway, we're talking about the New Blood podcast at some point. Where we, yeah. is that? Where yeah, we got, that's where we came from. How did we, yeah. how did we get from the New Blood podcast to the death of arena shooters? Because uh, I was talking about Dusk World, I'm, I'm always uh, going to be trying to pitch you guys. Oh, come on, just give us, just give it to us. But we we'll work it. out. We try. We we want to. Like it's well, Scott's super busy with uh, Dusk on Switch and Zombies doing SDK stuff um, for the main, you know, main SDK for single player. But uh, we'll get there. I mean, listen, we're not giving up on Dusk World. We definitely want it to be. It's a valuable part of the Dusk ecosystem. Um, and if like making it free and making it open source is a thing that people want, we're gonna we'll get it there eventually. It's just. You know, we don't rush, we don't stress, we don't crunch. It's one of those things that's been on the list for a long time, and, you know, it'll stay on the list until we get it done. Or not. <laughs> but so, the podcast. Yeah. What's the schedule going to be like? Oh, the, for the podcast? It's going to be yeah. like the same thing as everything else. We're going to do it whenever we fucking get around to it. <laughs> that's what um, I, I think, but we we're, people really like the first one, which is cool. Um, mm -hmm. We've got all, like tons of listens and like awesome comments. So we're like, cool, we should keep doing this. And I think what we're going to do is uh, make it so each episode focuses on a different game or series that we really like. So episode one was Doom. Uh, episode two is probably going to be Half-Life. And we'll probably get someone like Tyler from Valve News Network in there to talk about it with us. Um, we're definitely going to do like a Stalker episode. Um, you know, at some point, obviously, we got to get Civi on there to fucking talk about whatever. Maybe we'll do a Capstone uh podcast do a um, you podcast know. With yeah we'll do yeah we could do a build engine one we can get like um whatchamacallit some of the ion fury guys in there or something yeah. um you know it's uh there's it's limitless but i think focusing because otherwise we'll just meander and it'll just be like this podcast where we just go back and forth talking about whatever for hours right we need uh, i think if we want to do the new blood new blood podcast we got to pick a pick a game and stick to it or else we'll just talk forever um and then that gives us a good excuse to like switch out the um switch out the the people on it bring in a different person from different companies and stuff like that um it'll be good we'll definitely do like an immersive sim one maybe i can get fucking warren specter in to talk about uh to talk about the old looking glass days or harvey or someone like that i'll use some of my my clout to get some heavy hitters on the podcast uh but it's hard even with like someone getting like mark like i had to approve that with bethesda pr to get uh to get diaz on the podcast yeah. Uh, just to make sure he didn't say anything dumb, like that the swimming in Doom 2016 was the best swimming he'd ever had in a video game. <laughs> you could have Steven on and do System Shock all the way through too; it would be really cool. Yeah, I've just got sure. I've got all the like I, lots of expectations for that because I really like the format. I've, I was like blown away by what I thought originally when you said New Blood Podcast versus what it actually was. Like this is fucking great. 
Thanks, man. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying. And Christian did a good job of producing it. We're going to try to even up it next time. Definitely more mm-hmm. bullshit soundboard stuff. Uh, and then also better quality. We're going to try to separate the audio track so you can see who's talking. A lot of the people are be like, I don't know who's talking when. So we're going to try to separate the tracks and do visuals for that. Um, a lot of stuff we can do. Um, and it's uh, it's good. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, if people like it, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, kind of like this podcast, right? People like it. So you're going to keep doing it. Yeah, I think I'll do it regardless. I just love, you know, I love it, having an excuse to make you sit down and talk to me. Like that feels great. <laughs> Works for me, man. But, oh, and you know me, I can talk forever. You don't even have to, you don't even have to ask me anything. Just be like, Dave, go. And I'll be like, Brap. So I should have done. Just turned on the recorder. Be like, all right, I'll see you in an hour. Uh, <laughs> basically, but, basically. So the, I guess the last couple of things I wanted to get into is like, uh, you got rocket works and I feel like it doesn't come to the forefront of the conversation enough, like what you guys are doing over there. It's really yeah, cool. Cause it's I mean, none of most, cause most of our games aren't, you know, announced. So it's, it's right. hard. Um, yeah. Rocket works. So I, I, in 20, 2018, I came down here my buddy, Aaron, who I started new blood with, uh, he got a job with Dean hall and rocket works back in like 2015. And he's been working there for a while. Um, and he left now and he's doing an indie thing, which is pretty cool um and i went down and i visited and they were working on a shooter at the time and they were like you know we could use some help with this would you be interested in coming down and working here as a producer and i was like shit yeah i'll move to new zealand i ain't got no wife no kids i'm fucking i'd be keen to get out of the states if you pay me enough i'll do whatever the fuck you want um and i was like also you should probably you should hire some of my guys so i got zag hired i got hired we were gonna get christian hired but then that fell through uh, the guy, our community guy who produces the podcast and stuff. Um, and I, you know, I got down here and I was working on that shooter and then also Stationeers, uh, which is a very nerdy system based space game. Not my kind of game, but hey, it's it's a good game and people like it. And like I said, I like to expand my horizons as a producer, right? If I only ever worked on retro shooters, I would, you know, I'd be pigeonholing myself and not getting as much experience as I need to be a better producer and director and, you know, showrunner on these games. Um, and then Dean started a second studio up in Auckland, uh, before I even got here. Uh, he's like, oh, we got a new investment we're starting a new studio and bye, fuck off. I was like, what? Uh, and I got down here and he basically put me in charge of the Dunedin studio down here. So now I'm the studio head. I'm the studio director of Rocketworks Dunedin. And then Dean started another studio up in Auckland. So I've just kind of been left uh the inmates are kind of just running the asylum down here in Dunedin and we're working on three games uh you know stationers we're bringing back the out of ammo vr games and making them run on like uh, index and um cosmos and vive s and shit like that rift s and it's fun we're doing kind of the same thing it's mostly small projects indie games five ten man teams at the most and it's it's good because I can run New Blood essentially from anywhere, right? So why not the edge of the planet on the beach with fiber internet, which is better than I had in California? Cost me like half as much to live here as it does in California. Zag's doing good down here. Kate got a job down here. Um, everyone involved is doing good, and it allows me. And I took the job very openly, saying, "Now listen, you know the my salary from this gig and what it's going to afford me to do is basically run New Blood without any worries." Right. All the money I make at Rocketworks basically just goes right back into New Blood, you know, and paying the dudes and getting these games made. Uh, so it's, you know, one, you know, one, it's like my day job funding my night gig, basically. Um, mm-hmm. Even though New Blood's, New Blood's doing fine on its own, but like, listen, every little bit helps. Um, so I guess across the two companies, I'm producing like 11 games <laughs> right now. It's, uh, they're all in different, you know, they're all in different parts of my head. The thing, the hardest thing for us to do is honestly not, take on new projects the guys every five minutes are like dave please no no more games we don't have we don't have the manpower for all these fucking games but i'm like but it's so cute i want to work on ultra kill you guys hockey is really nice <laughs> uh it helps that they all like the game too but uh that's it's cool to be in a place where like you've got too much shit to work on right yeah. um and that's kind of where I find myself. It's weird, especially with the world where it is. Like, I feel very blessed to be down here in New Zealand uh, working on games where, you know, like our way of life hasn't really changed much. We sell digital games. We make video games. We're, listen, we New Blood's been virtual for five years, you know. We don't, we didn't have an office yet. So we're used, nothing, literally nothing has changed for us. So we're very fortunate in that way. So, like, during this thing, what we've really been trying to do is just kind of grow our community, give shit away, be, you know, be just 
kind of grow what we've already got doing, you know, work on stuff, get updates out for our games, do some game jams, do some fun shit and kind of just like, uh, you know, ride this thing out, but keep, uh, keep the philosophy going. You know, we love you and we, so, if, you know, if, uh, if the world's kind of going to shit, the new blood family, we're, we're here for you, man. Discord.gg slash new blood. I just, I just made a new, uh, website, coomhub.com. <laughs> <laughs> that'll take you to our steam page we hate dot money waste dot money i've got i counted the other day i've got 58 joke urls for our stupid bullshit well, it's, it's been an excellent dumb. marketing tactic though like really i does. guess yeah the, the not fortnite.com one really <laughs> did pretty well when i was launching dusk and people were like oh you're a genius i'm like i literally just thought that up while i was taking a shit i was like i wonder if that's taken the fuck g2a.com is one of my favorites uh, and for the podcast, we made just listen to dot us and please don't hate dot us. Uh, <laughs> that one's good. Um, and then new blood dot show. But it's been good, man. Like we started the pod. Like this is we finally started the podcast. We're finally doing some game jams. We got some long awaited updates out for medieval and maximum action and dusk. Um, the dusk SDK and the mods are super. The, the levels that people have been making for the dusk SDK are awesome, man. Some of these levels, I'm like, damn, David, this is what dusk would be like if you were good. <laughs> And it's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been fun. You know, it's, it's fun to, I'm glad we're at where we're at with our community and with our brand and with the games and with my developers, like can't complain, you know, it's, we're, we're very fortunate and I'm trying to spread that around as best that we can. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge fan of you as a person and of your company and everything that like you're Thanks, man. an inspiration and a hero. I love it. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I'll take the compliment, man. Dave, thank you very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Sorry it took me so long. <laughs> uh, you know, hopefully next time, if there is a next time, uh, you'll be able to get in touch with me uh, sooner. But as always, feel free to reach out. Uh, talk to any of my devs. I mean, if you want to talk about Gloomwood or whatever, get uh, get Dylan on. If you want to talk about Duskworld, you can get you know Scott on. We could do a Duskworld one. And by all means, get Steve on the podcast. Everybody needs a little Steve in their life. We will. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Man. Thanks for having me, man. Mm -hmm. All right. Big thank you, of course, to Dave Oshry for coming on the show uh, with his busy schedule and finally making it happen for us. That was amazing. Also want to say thank you to all of the Dusk and Dusk World community. You guys know who you are and you know that you are dear to my heart. Thank you to everyone who supports The Keep. You know who you are. Hit us up on inthekeep.com to find ways to support if you would like to. But otherwise, just hang in there and stay in the keep.